How fast should you run when training for a race? Today we have Frankie Dades. Frankie is a fitness athlete who has competed in marathons and bodybuilding. He was a solid high school athlete, but he always held himself back from achieving his full potential because of his lack of mental strength. Now Frankie inspires people to break through their mental barriers through his own journey of strength training and marathon training. In 2020, he started running, did a half marathon, then prepared for a full marathon, but then endured a bad injury because of, it, because of his poor training style. If you're a runner, then you might be surprised by how fast Frankie says you should be running when you're training. For now, it's time to get closer to your best you with Frankie Dades. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast. Today, I am super excited to be joined by Frankie Dades. Uh, Frankie, you like to say that you played multiple sports in high school, but you were successful at none of them. I heard you talk about that, um, and you kind of attribute that to a lack of mental strength and some self-doubt and your own lack of maybe motivation and you weren't as hard of a worker growing up as you are now. Um, but now I look at you on social media and stuff and you're a freaking beast. Like the way the runs that you do, like you're strong as hell, like in your transformation pictures and stuff are just inspiring on Instagram. And I know it's inspiring to so many. Um, so we're going to get into a lot today, but I just want to dive right into some meat and potato stuff about like your training regimen because I know you run a lot, but you also are strong as hell and, and big and muscular. So I want to ask you from a training regimen, cardio versus weights, what does your breakdown usually look like on a weekly basis? So during marathon prep, uh, I cut my lifting down to three, maybe four days a week. Um, and the way I structure it is, so I'm, I'm on a five day running uh, cycle. So it's Monday, Tuesday are easy runs. Wednesday is generally a speed day. Thursday, I'm off. Friday is another easy run. And then Saturday is a long run with like sometimes some marathon paces mixed in there. So what I found works for me and allows me to recover and be able to perform on those important days, which are the speed days and the long run days, I'll keep my lift only on days that I'm running easy. So like Monday, Tuesday, I'll do my... I'll do a legs. Maybe after that, I'll do push day. And then, you know, Thursday or Friday, I'll do a pull day. And, and like I said, maybe four days if I'm feeling all right, uh, I'll throw in another lifting day if I have the time for it. But right now I do, you got to prioritize like running. I, like I have a goal that I set with the marathon. I want to hit that. So that's going to be number one. Lifting is afterwards. I still do make sure in order to keep and maintain uh, my, some of my strength and size, um, I do, you know, I make sure those, that 45 minutes to an hour in a gym is very intentional and, uh, you know, hitting everything I have to hit. So it's, it's definitely something you have to work out, work around and see what works for you and how your body reacts to it. You can't just go in there and expect to still lifting as hard as you were off season or whatever. So it takes some time. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's hard to mix in both, especially when you're doing marathon training, because just sheer scheduling wise as well, because when you're doing these long runs, like it could take you an hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on how long you're running and stuff like that. So I know practically it's hard to fit in as well. When you talk about Monday, Tuesday and Friday are some of your easy runs, I want you to talk to people about what easy means from like a relative to you with regards to like pace and like what your race pace might look like and maybe with regard to your heart rate intensity because i think a lot of people who are runners just think always as fast as i can go the the better it is so talk to us about what easy means for you yeah that was that's my fault I, I always say that to people who like are new into running or don't run at all and i'm like yeah five mile easy run though. what like five mile easy like it you have to explain what it means. So it's my fault. Uh, so easy runs are runs that are at your uh, in your aerobic base, which is um, you. I use the formula. It's called the math formula. M A F. Uh, it's one eighty minus your age is the max heart rate that uh, you should be at when you're running. Um, and you kind of subtract from that number, and you stay within that range. You you I use my watch and monitors heart rate. Um, and I make sure I'm in that, that heart rate range when I'm doing those easy runs. The point of that is 
one to still get those miles on your feet, but you're running at such a like lower intensity for what you would be running on a speed day or marathon day, whatever, um, that it allows your body to recover better. Um, you're still also building your aerobic base, which aerobic base is your, your, your engine, let's put it like that. It's like the, the engine that keeps you running and those anaerobic days when you're going fast, that's, that's what, uh, teaches your body to flush out lactate and the better that your aerobic system is the quicker your body flushes lactate out of your blood which will correlate to race day so for example um i'm like i'm i'm marathon pace right now is about a 724 to 730 minute per mile pace and my easy run days depending on temperature because that does play a big uh, role in there my easy run pace could be anywhere from like 8.30 to 8.59 minutes. Um, so it's, it's a generally like a minute, maybe more of a difference between your actual marathon pace that you're aiming for and like the easy run uh, pace. Yeah, I, lo- I'm, I appreciate you so elaborately laying that out for us. I want to make sure I have the calculation that you did down right. So you do 180 minus your age is the max heart rate that you want to be at when you're doing those long, those easy runs. So if you're 30 years old, 180 minus 30 is 150. You don't want to go above 150 on your easy runs. Yes. And then what do you kind of, what's, what do you want to be above? Is it like 130 to 150? What, what, what? Subtract 10, subtract, subtract 10, 10 from that. And uh, yeah. And that's, that's generally where you could stay around. But the truth is um, like, and, and that's, problem like you said everybody goes out uh runs at, and as fast as they possibly can and that's the biggest mistake i made that mistake for a long time which is why i hated running i just went out i was trying i was like i'm doing three miles and i tried to do it as fast as i could and i, I found myself panting for air half half a mile in i'm like what the hell so the the truth is your body does not know pace it knows effort so you want to keep, let's just say, you, you, like we all have like an ego thing. We want to keep our pace like fast. We see other people who are running fast, easy runs. So we're worried about that. But the truth is that your body doesn't know the difference of when your heart rate's like 125, 130 or 150. You're still getting the same benefit. So ideally, the lower it could be and that you're comfortable at is the same like so if you're comfortable like if you want to run with 130 beats per minute for your entire easy run that's no different essentially than running at 150 beats you're just kind of the higher your heart rate is the more stress it's putting on your body but ideally you don't want to go higher than that that 180 minus your age number so under that you could really stay wherever you please like if you want to go easy the easier the better the easier the more you'll feel better and on those speed days you can kill yourself on those easy run days. So now you could really give all that effort that you need for those, those speed days. So it's, it's essentially, uh, it's just a gauge to go off of the numbers. Yeah, no, I love that. I've, I've never done a marathon before, but I've done a few half marathons. I'm actually training for one in February coming up. And that is something that I have to continually remind myself, you know, as an athlete growing up, you always think the lower the pace, the better, or like the heavier, the weight, the better. And that's not, true a lot of the time, right? There's a lot of context that needs to be discussed when you're thinking about that. And I have to consciously hold myself back from going too hard of a pace to make sure um, that I am not going to injure myself. I am not overdoing it. And I can really build that aerobic base like you're talking about. Um, Now let's dive into the injury. So to a lot of people are listening and are probably starting to be a little bit convinced around, okay, maybe I need to go a little bit slower. This guy knows what he's talking about. What was the injury that you endured uh, that you're talking about? Okay. Uh, so you want me to just, I, I, I got to tell this, this story of the full year to understand how stupid I was. Uh, <laughs> it was just, I'll make it as, as long and short as possible. Um, so last year yeah last yeah last year half um so i had gotten into running during covid uh 2020 it was kind of just learning to get better I had to had to learn everything basically i just talked about and more obviously but i was coaching myself still was very ignorant to the sport and what it entails i was like i was still like trying to keep up 
lifting as much as I was running, which I wasn't really training for anything at the time. And that was fine. Um, but then I just was like, started, I finally like learned and I started to see some progress after finally doing it the right way, because I had no idea there was even a right way to run. Um, and I was like, ah, I'll sign up for a half marathon. So I sign up for my first half marathon and, and completely ignorant, like I said, and, and what I was doing, um, coached myself, followed like a pro, a, a, like a outline of like a program I found just to see like the general structure of a running program. Um, went in there and with really no time goal, I kind of just wanted to run it. And I wanted to, for my first half marathon, for not really knowing much and training myself, I did sub two hours. I ran, uh, 157 hour 57. And I was like riding a high. I was like, wow, this is, that, that was so much fun. I was like, so initially my goal was to go straight from that to hop into a full marathon prep, which would have been ideal. Um, a week before my half marathon, I had a friend that, uh, was in a bodybuilding, um, group and he was like, like, I will, he, he was like, oh, you walk around pretty, uh, pretty lean. Like you should really try and compete. And I, at first I was like, no, get the hell out of here. And then it like, it was something I always like thought about, but had no idea again, where to start, like no idea, no knowledge of the sport. And I was like, you know what? Fine. So like, a week before my half marathon, I started prep for bodybuilding because the show, the season usually ends in like November. Um, and it was, that was around September. So like I had, I had to start prep then, which was again, stupid. Like they have nothing to do with each other, bodybuilding and running. Like you need to eat to fuel yourself for running and bodybuilding. You're constantly cutting calories. So stupid me started that. I had about an eight week prep, nine week prep um, in bodybuilding no, at the beginning of November, competed in my first physique show. I wound up taking first place in my class, which was, I was not even expecting to place. Like it was a great, it was a great experience, but it was not something that I see myself continuing to do, but I had a great experience. I did it. Now here's where the stupid part comes in. Um, at the time, I was working with a company, BPN, and they had a marathon that they hosted. It was like a private marathon. Uh, they do it every year. And I wanted to be like, I had a bunch of friends that were uh, going to race it. I was like, yo, I want to get in. So they got me in. The problem was that was the beginning of November and uh, the marathon was January 29th. And so it gave me about 10, nine, 10 weeks to train for that. After coming off of nine weeks of not running for bodybuilding prep. It was stupid. It was so dumb. I kind of hopped right into prep, um, <laughs> jacked up my mileage right away, which was stupid. And I was again, coaching myself. Like you could coach yourself through a half marathon and probably get away with it. I wouldn't recommend with no knowledge, coaching yourself in a, in a full marathon prep, because it's a completely different animal than a half marathon. So I'm like, yeah, I'll just, you know, I ran a half, I could run a full um, yeah, just to cut it short, I trained, it was a miserable training. Like it was, it was my first time training during the winter. Like, so, um, marathon day comes and my goal was sub four hours. I was like, Oh, I ran sub two hours for the half. I could do sub four for a full again. Not, not true at all. Um, the, the race was in like the back country roads of Austin, Texas, and it was hilly rolling hills the entire time. And it was like 20 mile per hour headwinds the entire time. So I'm like completely unprepared for this. Like had no idea. I was not, I, I was like still, my body was still like recovering from the, the bodybuilding prep and being so depleted that like I was weak. I wasn't, my legs were not strong. I wasn't lifting like I should have been like, it was just, I did not feel myself. So toe the line, start running. Now, during the race, uh, it was kicking my ass. I definitely felt it, but I was on pace for like a three hour 50 marathon. If you look at my paces for the thing, uh, for the, from the race, it was, uh, definitely on pace for it. So I'm like looking and I'm hanging on for dear life, but I was like, all right, if I hold this, I'll be fine. Uh, mile 20 comes around, my quad starts twitching and I'm like, I never felt that before. What the hell is that? Mile 20.5, my leg locks up. I can't bend it. I fall to the ground and my my quad is just convulsing like this. 
And I'm like, it looked like an alien was in my leg. It was crazy. I was like, what the hell? And like I said, it was a private marathon. So no one is around me. Um, I'm looking around. I'm like seeing if anyone's going to come. I, I started contemplating just quitting. Like, so I somehow get my bent, my leg to bend. I stand up and I limp. I, I, I like jog and limp for the last six miles of the race brutally painful every voice that said quit cut like next aid station quit 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 came in my head and i somehow talked myself through it and traveled the six miles and crossed the finish line at four hours 19 minutes um learned from that hopped in a prep right after that hired a coach and made made complete changes to what i was doing and fixed my my mistakes and then four months to the day i um pr'd by 42 minutes in buffalo new york so i was i got a 337 marathon now i'm like i'm like all right now let's go again and this is where this is all stupid and i'll explain why um that was may new york city marathon is in november so from may to november i'm like i want to run new york city and i want to get like a 320 325 um prepping and but i went right back into it which was dumb and it went fine through the summer. I was really making progress. September comes around. I go out for a 14 mile, uh, easy long run. And at the end of it, I just feel in my, in my, it was weird. It was in my ankle. I feel like this pain, I can't really bear weight on it. I'm like, what the hell is that? I'm like, all right, it's just like a little ache and pain. It'll go away. It wasn't too bad. And it just didn't go away. And now I'm running on it. I'm still running on it through September. It's getting worse and worse to the point where like, Every time I went out, like it was excruciating pain in my ankle and my shin. And I'm like, oh, I got shin splints. It's, uh, so I'm trying to like roll it out, stretch it out. I'm going to PTs and they're like, oh yeah, it's just shin splints, whatever. It got so bad, like to the point where I'd go out, I'd take one step. My heart rate was already at 180 because of the pain. Like it was so bad. And uh, so this, now we're getting closer to race day for New York. And I think it was, a, it was actually October 20th. I had gotten an MRI like October 18th, October 20th. I had like a big 18 mile workout, which was like marathon paces in there. So I go out and I do this workout, not knowing what the hell is wrong with my leg. It was brutal, but I finished the workout. I hit all my splits. And then I had a zoom call with my doctor after to talk about the MRI. So I hop on the zoom call and he's like, yeah, uh, so you have a stress fracture shows me the picture shows the 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 where the stress fracture is uh, it was it was the edema from it was like radiating to my ankle which is why it was like i was feeling it in multiple places so i'm like uh doc i just ran 18 miles today and he goes what he goes listen i'm not gonna tell you not to to, to pull out of this marathon he's like but i'm just telling you if you run on it there's a chance it's gonna get a lot worse it looks like it's already starting to heal a little bit Let's not push it. So I was like, all right, I'll pull out. It was two weeks later, the marathon. So it killed me. But like I had to, I, I, my health comes first. You know, it's not that big a deal. You want to heal up. You don't want it to be worse and be out longer than you have to be. So I took two months off from running, which, you know, it, it takes a big mental toll on you, especially when it's something you've been doing for three years now. It's like, it also becomes like your mental escape in a sense. And, uh, that was my stupidity. So my overall point of the, the the that whole story was I was doing one thing after the other for, oh, I, at that time, it was a year, year and a half, whatever it was, like just one, one goal after the other. And you see that a lot. And like, I was doing that before it was like, you see all these kids on social media now that are like, oh, I'm doing this and then I'm doing this and then I'm doing this. That was just because I really started to like, prove to myself that I'm capable of things. And like, I, I really wanted to keep doing that, but I also didn't realize that like, if you don't give your body a break, it's going to break because it doesn't care about, uh, like what you have on your schedule. It's gonna, if you don't let it recover, it's, it's going to break. And I learned that because I was doing all these things one after the other. I did not give myself any time to rest and then I had a stress fracture that put me at sidelined me for a couple months. And I basically had to start from scratch from when I came back and it could have been a lot worse if I was stupid and, and decided to run that marathon on there. So the overall point of that is 
understand that recovery is just as important as working out. So like you got to learn to listen to your body. You need to learn that there's reasons for off seasons and whatever you do, that's that time for your body to rejuvenate and recover and get stronger. And you could essentially have an injury free career and whatever you do, if you do it the right way, but don't get caught up in that. I got to keep doing the next big thing because of whatever you see like take the time there's nothing wrong with it you'll thank yourself in the long run yeah no doubt and i also think the big less one of the big lessons from that is you can get to a certain level of performance on your own with somewhat limited knowledge but then it's like when you start taking on bigger goals loftier goals get somebody who's more of an expert in that area who can make sure that you don't make these stupid mistakes of training too hard training too fast and and training too often like like you like you did but i mean Hey, it, it, it's a great story, and I appreciate you diving all into that. That was super riveting, and I know everybody um, really enjoyed it. I think the way, one of the kind of the way I want to finish, actually, before I go into the psychological aspect of like your transformation and your identity transformation, I want to go back to. I know you've got a really busy work schedule. What do you, what are some of the habits that you do on a regular basis? Like your training schedule is is a lot like you do a lot of different training schedules. I'm sure you're pretty cognizant of the food that you're putting in your body. And so what are some of the habits that you do to set yourself up nutritionally and to make sure your fitness, you have time for your fitness plan? What are some of the things that you do to make it all happen each week? Yeah, that's a good question. And again, this is something you gotta, you gotta like practice and, and mess around. Let's see what works for you. So first thing first is plan ahead i forward plan so like i have a whiteboard with a calendar on it and there's a part of the month then there's the week uh and then there's the day like it's it's a it's a plotted out uh count uh whiteboard that you could write on so i'll do like write in anything important through the whole calendar for the month that, that i need to remember that i know i have to do whatever it is then for the week i'll be like all right I'll write everything from my workouts that I have to do, my running that I have to do, work, what needs to get done. And from the beginning of the week, I already know essentially what I'm going to be doing for that week. Like Monday, I know what I'm, I'm going to be doing. And Tuesday, I know maybe I have to be in work earlier, so I'm going to have to be up earlier. Obviously, this is all, you know, just a rough draft because life comes up and you need to be able to adapt and move around. Um, but yeah, that's the first important thing is to plan ahead and, and see what you have for the week in your schedule. And you could, you, you'll be, uh, successful. I would say like 90% of the time until life throws something at you, but yeah, it helps a lot because I already know it's not like the day of, I'm like, oh crap, I got to do this. I got to do this. I already know what I'm going to be doing. So that also allows you the night before to prepare for the day, the next day. So I'll, the next day. I'll, well, I'll look, I'll see what I have tomorrow. All right. I'll get my clothes out. If I got to run in the morning, I'm going to get my running clothes out. Then I'm going to pack, you know, maybe my clothes for work or, or if I'm going to the gym right after my run, I'll also get those clothes ready to go lift. Um, I prep my meals ahead of time. I also track my calories, pretty much making sure I hit my protein goal, the carbs I need to fuel myself. It's very important to have a visual of what you are going to do and and it makes your life 10 times easier so that's uh the first important thing the second is have non-negotiables that's something i say a lot i have it on my watch right here if you see it says non-negotiable um your non-negotiable is something that you have to do for yourself every single day whatever that may be if it's journaling if it's running if it's lifting reading Make a non-negotiable and do that first thing in the morning every single day. And the reason I say that is because let's say you're non-negotiable. I'll just use running. Let's say you're non-negotiable is to you want to run every day, whether you're training for something or not. And but you go to work it for like 9 a.m. or whatever. You sleep in, you use that time, you sleep in, sleep as long as you possibly can. You go to work at nine. You get out of five, your plan is to run after work. But now you're driving home, you hit traffic, you're tired. Something comes up, you have to go to the store, you have to pick something up. Something, everything, life always gets in the way. So now 
What's the first thing you're going to put off? That thing that you had to do for yourself. So now your day became you're doing everything for everyone and everything else but yourself. So your non-negotiable should be, all right, I have to be in work at nine. I have a 30 minute commute. Maybe I wake up at five. I go, I go outside, do my run and get that run done before. That way, it, nothing gets in the way of it. You did something for you first and you you're you're set up for the day then then there could be all the traffic in the world after you don't care there could be you could have to go to the store or you could whatever you're you did what you had to do for you and now you just go to bed a little bit earlier which that allows you to now and then you wake up early and you get it done but that should be your non-negotiable whatever it is wake up a little bit earlier do it first so that nothing can get in the way and when you do that that thing that's for you and you part like you do it to make you happy then the rest of your day is is set amen to that it's your your life gets more complicated as the day goes on and like you said not only are you going to get it in but you're going to feel so much better about yourself both mentally and physically as you go throughout the day um this has been great down to the last couple of questions frankie second to last one is your transformation is very apparent both physically and i know mentally is a big part of that for you as well so what is the biggest difference between your internal self-talk dialogue now when it comes to how you see yourself from the health and fitness standpoint compared to what it used to be kind of before you underwent some of this transformation yeah uh as you had touched upon earlier i was just very inconfident in myself i had no nothing good to say about myself and I had all the talent in the world in every sport I played. I was I boxed my whole life, played football, basketball. Like I was not bad. Like I had talent, but that can only take you so far if you don't have the heart, which I didn't have. Just for whatever reason, I just psyched myself out. Everyone was better than me. I and then as I got older, it just compounded and it became like it became like laziness and I would just quit everything and anything that anytime there was like a roadblock and a challenge I just crumbled and quit. That was, and, and like when you quit once, one time, you create that habit because then the next time you hit something hard, your body, your mind like goes right back to, oh, I quit last time, I could do it again. And then it becomes easier and easier and easier. And that's exactly where I was because I allowed that to become a habit for my entire life. So a lot of times, like back then, it would be, you can't do it. Uh, you're not capable. You're just not, genetically blessed like every single thing that you could tell yourself is what i told myself and i believed it now the difference between then and now is i still you know you'll still get those voices in your head like oh that you can't do that or you know you're you're not built for that like whatever it is but i'm like okay let's let's prove us like i know that listening to those voices has gotten me nowhere and it got me nowhere i experienced it i know it's like all right you you saw where that got you you quit everything you were unsuccessful unfulfilled in whatever you did let's try the other road of ignoring it and doing it and, and it goes back to like that just that year that i was just telling you about is i was ignoring those voices and each time was doing things that i never imagined i would do you know i would and you kind of build what I, I call it your I call it your resume. You're building a resume, so it's like now each time you get a win, don't don't like hang your hat on that resume in the sense of like your your con like I I ran a half marathon or I ran a marathon and I'm like I, three years later I'm like yeah well I ran a marathon three years ago like don't hang your hat on it but always reflect back on what your resume is. So like now when those voices come in as you keep getting those wins you become stronger and a voice becomes a little bit smaller. So it comes in your head and it's like, well, I did this. I did that. I did that. I got through that. I limped six miles in the backcountry roads with a leg that couldn't bend. Like I could get through this and then you do it. And then there's more confidence. That's another thing on your resume. So build your resume, start slow, start small. But once you start getting, even like daily wins help. Like it's like tomorrow, if I have to be up early, and I get up early, I do that run. The day after, it's not as hard because it's like, I did that yesterday. Look at that. And like, maybe it's maybe it was colder yesterday morning. It's like, you did that yesterday and it was colder. Like, so just small wins will compound over time and build your confidence up. 
And that's the difference. You're always going to have those voices. The motivation will not be there more than half the time. You just need to have the discipline to do it and, and understand that you can do it if you allow yourself. And that if you don't and fall into that comfort trap, it will get you nowhere in life. That's really solid, dude. That's really solid. And I love how you talked about the balance of you're building a resume and that resume, you don't want to get complacent with it. You don't want to hang your hat on it. And when I hear people who are just always talking about what they did in the past, I'm like, if, you have, if you're just always talking about your past, you don't have exciting enough stuff in the future. But at the same time, it should be a huge confidence builder. Like you said, you should reflect back on it. You shouldn't hang your hat on it, but you should reflect on it and let you... Let that drive you and fuel you and allow you to move forward with confidence in the future. That was so uh, so well said. Uh, but before I go to the last question here, Frankie, I just want to acknowledge you, man, for you breaking the pattern of the internal self-dialogue that you used to have. That's one of the most difficult things to do. Like you said, if you see yourself see uh, confront a challenge and then quit, it's so easy to just stay with that cycle throughout the throughout your entire life, but you took it upon yourself to be like, you know what? This hasn't serving me. This hasn't been serving me the way I want it to. I'm going to break this pattern. I'm going to move the other way. And then for you to begin your transformation, uh, maybe in, the, in a less intelligent manner, but then humble yourself, get a coach and go about it the right way. And you've learned so much from it. And I know that you're just going to continue to up-level yourself moving forward in the future. Thank you, bro. I appreciate that. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. Well, if you guys don't follow him on Instagram already, you need to make sure you follow him at Dranky Fades on Instagram. Uh, Frankie the Greek is also his name on Instagram. I'll make sure I have that tagged up in the show notes. He's also a host of a podcast called the Non-Negotiable Podcast. Uh, but Frankie, is there any other good place where people should go learn more about you? Uh, as of right now, that's the main place I'm, I'm looking. I have a couple of YouTube videos, but that's uh, I'm something I kind of fell off of for a while i'm looking to get back into it. but right now that those are the those are the two main places beautiful beautiful awesome man well last question is a hypothetical question if for whatever reason you were only able to do three healthy habits for the rest of your life you couldn't do a million different things but you had to choose like i'm only able to do three healthy habits for the rest of my life what would those three healthy habits be um I would say nutrition as a healthy habit. That's definitely one that's most important thing. Um, that's your gas in the tank. Uh, walking, because I I mean, if you can't run, walking is great. Like 10,000 steps a day can take you so far uh, in, in the realm of health. And lifting. Lifting is definitely, like I said, my first love. And, you know, that that it makes me feel... It, like at the mental aspect of it makes me feel great. So those three uh, definitely yeah. most important. I love it. I was wait. I was like, lifting's got to be in there for the way you talked about it early on. I was like, I figured it had to be in there. But that was awesome stuff today, man. I really appreciate. it. I know so many people got so much specific value with regard to listening to what your regimen was for training, and hopefully, a lot of people learned how to not overtrain from a running standpoint in particular, so they can avoid injuries and avoid overtraining and everything like that and fuel them to maybe hit PRs and whatever race that they're doing in the future. And then I loved the way that we finished with kind of the self-talk, the internal dialogue, building that resume, not hanging your hat on it, but letting it be a confidence builder fuel, fueling you moving forward. So this was awesome today, Frankie. Appreciate your time, man. That's all we got. Thanks for having me, bro. What an awesome it. interview with Frankie, both informative and inspiring. If you'd like to go try out the one-week free trial of the virtual 10-week transformation, then go to nickcarrier.com slash free trial. The next program will begin January 22nd, 2024. Some of my biggest takeaways from Frankie are, number one, if you're a runner, strength training is critical to muscle retention and injury prevention. Number two, don't go into a big goal with little expertise. Seek out expert help so you don't injure yourself. Number three, runners, faster is not always better. This is something that I have to continually remind myself during my training, but the pace that you train at does not need to be your race pace. Do 180 minus your age, and that equals the max your heart rate should be at when you're doing more of your easier runs. And then if you do 180 minus your age minus your 10, that's kind of the bottom of the range of where your heart rate should be at. So to give an example for easy numbers, if you're 30 years old, then your heart rate should be around 140 to 150 when you're doing your training on your easier runs. 
And then lastly, build your resume. Don't hang your hat on your resume, but let it fuel you with confidence to take on new exciting challenges in the future. If you can do these things, it will help you get closer to the healthiest version of you and ultimately closer and closer to your best you.